Warm greetings. The following tutorial will cover cholangiocarcinoma. It's not meant to be comprehensive, but it'll give you some information on uh, this disease and uh, talk a little bit about some of its imaging features and what to look out for. So it's not that common, but as it turns out, it is the second most common primary liver neoplasm after hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's worth knowing a little bit about this disease. When you look under histology, the vast majority of these neoplasms are going to be adenocarcinomas. And these are neoplasms that arise from the biliary tree. They can be intrahepatic ducts or the extrahepatic ducts, but uh, that's where they arise from these cholangiocarcinomas. When you look at all patients with cholangiocarcinomas, we end up finding that they most often are seen in patients towards the sixth and seventh decades of life. But it is important to know that they can be seen earlier in patients who have risk factors for developing cholangiocarcinoma. Now, there are a number of risk factors, but some of the more common ones we see are primary sclerosis and cholangitis, cholidocal cysts, which are not that common, but uh, when we do see them, they can uh, be associated with cholangiocarcinomas and then recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. Slightly more common in males, uh, but they can certainly be seen in females and a predilection for developing in patients of Asian descent. Now, how do these patients present? Well, you're going to find the occasional patient who comes in where this is somewhat incidentally found, but more often they are going to present with some types of symptoms. Uh, common symptoms, of course, being the presence of abdominal pain and pruritus. That's another common symptom we can see with patients who end up having cholangiocarcinomas. On exam, they can have jaundice, can be painful jaundice, painless jaundice, and they may uh, report history of weight loss over the last few months. So in all signs that uh, indicate that there's an underlying neoplastic process. When you draw labs for these patients, look out for signs of biliary obstruction, such as increased bilirubin or alkaline phosphatase levels. Some tumor markers may be elevated, but they're not specific necessarily for cholangiocarcinoma. Now, when we think of cholangiocarcinomas, we can really categorize them according to locations. Now, amongst the more common locations are the ones that are located in the hilar or perihilar region, and these sometimes are uh, often referred to as Klatskin tumors. So if you come across that term, it's referring to a tumor in this location. Um, the, another common location that they can occur is along the distal common bile ducts. So this is at some distance away from the uh, common hepatic duct, really toward in, in the region of the common bile duct itself. And finally, least common is the ones that are uh, referred to as the peripheral cholangiocarcinomas or the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. So you have three locations that you want to look for and uh, the first two locations often these patients on imaging will you know manifest as regions of stricturing. Um, you may see a discrete polypoid or nodular mass but often it's just an area of bile wall thickening resulting in a stricture and biliary ductal uh, dilatation. The ones that are peripheral intrahepatic may also appear this way, but they often are more mass-like in their appearance. Now, some of the general imaging features that uh, can be seen with cholangiocarcinomas include the fact that, uh, you know, these masses tend to be quite ill-defined in their appearance, so where they start and where they end is somewhat difficult at times to uh, accurately delineate. Um, when you give contrast, they tend to have arterial rim enhancement, so the rim of the lesion will enhance after giving contrast. And uh, when you sort of wait on the portal venous phase and the remaining phases, you'll end up seeing more progressive central uh, patchy fill-in of the lesion. It's not quite like a hemangioma where you have discontinuous peripheral nodular enhancement with sort of progressive fill-in. This tends to be a lot more heterogeneous, more rim enhancement, quite patchy uh, fill-in, but the most uh, critical features that when you look at the more delayed phase images, typically when you wait around 10 minutes, that's when this lesion really enhances. That's when you see the contrast really accumulate within the region. That's thought to be the you know, underlying fibrous stroma that can be seen with these cholangiocarcinomas. So that enhances most avidly at the 10 minute phase as opposed to the earlier phases. Now the imaging features can be quite suggestive of cholangiocarcinoma, but it's important to know that you're going to need a biopsy to confirm that. So whether you get that through ERCP or uh, percutaneously, that's how you're going to have to confirm the presence of a cholangiocarcinoma. Now let's dive deeper into the three uh, common locations. First one, of course, being the hilar perihilar location, sometimes refers to as the Klatskin tumor. And it's important to remember that uh, this is further classified according to the bismuth correlate classification. And so whether or not you use these in your reports 
is really um, up to you, but it's important to at least know of it um, in order to be able to describe where these lesions occur. Now the first one in this classification refers to a lesion that is within the common hepatic duct, but it is more than two centimeters from the biliary confluence. The second within this classification is a lesion that, again, is in the common hepatic duct, but is within two centimeters of the biliary confluence. So when you do see these lesions, it's important to really describe, if possible, your um, distance from that biliary confluence as that uh, changes the classification. Now the third in this classification refers to a lesion that is at the biliary confluence itself. And then this is further classified as 3A, if it creeps up and involves the right hepatic ducts, or 3B, if it goes towards the left hepatic duct. So that's how we can further classify these on imaging. And finally, the bismuth correlate classification number four refers to a lesion that uh, is at the biliary confluence, involves both the right and left hepatic ducts, or there's more multifocal disease seen in, in several segments of the biliary tree. Now the distal cholangiocarcinomas are seen within the common bile duct as a region of stricturing causing upstream ductal dilatation. And finally, the peripheral where the intrahepatic duct lesions are seen really within the liver parenchyma itself. And these ones can appear more mass-like as can be seen over here. These tend to have more ill-defined borders and particularly when they're abutting the capsule or next to the capsule can result in capsular retraction, which is something one should look out for where there's focal indentation of the capsule towards the lesion. And this can also be associated, uh, depending on where the location is, with the dilatation of the ducts upstream from this region. Now, a few final um, comments on some of the general imaging features that I wanted to mention. When you do see these lesions, it's important to remember to look for the upstream ductal dilatation. That can be a clue that there is a neoplastic process involved in the ability to retreat, and you can see that with either of these locations, hilar, distal, or peripheral, um, so that's something to look out for. And whenever possible, it's important to try to describe the relationship of this mass to the adjacent vasculature, namely the portal veins, hepatic veins, and the hepatic arteries. And then of course look for metastatic disease. Lymphadenopathy uh, is something that's often seen in these patients, particularly in the hilar region. And uh, with more advanced disease, some carcinomatosis can also be seen with patients with cholangiocarcinoma. With that, I thank you for your attention.